Uh, network. Uh, welcome to today's afternoon uh, echo, Monday the 10th. Uh, we have a very, uh, a very enlightening uh, topic of discussion. Uh, we will be looking at QI, QA uh, systems and tools for HIV uh, program. And uh, to do to deliver this uh, session this afternoon will be our Dr. James Simpungwe. And uh, Dr. Simpungwe, welcome uh, on the call. Are you able to just say hello? Thank you. Yes, yes, right. I am. Thank you, Dr. Ziambo, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. All right. Uh, so we also have um, Western Province uh, this afternoon. They will also be sharing their QI project, and we'll have uh, the presenter Susiku Mangala, uh, coming from Mongu District. Uh, Susiku Mangala, are you on the call? Would you like to say hello? Uh, good afternoon. Yes, I think I have logged in. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for putting, into putting this together. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We want to recognize uh, Chinsali District Health Office. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are happy that you took time to join us. Uh, are you able to hear us loud and clear? Chinsali uh, District Health Office. We also, we also recognize uh, Chadiza District Hospital, uh, Eastern Province. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Zico. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, just to mention a few, we yes, have- can uh, hear you, Thank you, thank you for joining us. We have Cabo Central Hospital, the Wanika General Hospital, Itambia Rural Health Center, Western Province. Yes, we can hear you, Doc. Thank you so much for joining us. So I just want to introduce to you, uh, in the hub, we have uh, amongst us a team from uh, Eastern Province, a very, very powerful team uh, from Eastern Province has come to, uh, to share some best practices with us. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a combination of doctors, nurses, uh, nurse, uh, nurse prescribers, uh, HIV nurse prescribers, uh, lab and pharmacy team. So they are here, and I think they'll just wave uh, to the to the audience. Uh, just just wave to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are also in the uh, here in the hub. We are with uh, uh, Sister uh, Evelyn Mwamba, who will be giving us the recap for this afternoon. And so, and uh, the IT Mr. Chatonda is here. So we'll start, and we'll just allow Sister Evelyn Mwamba to just run us through a recap. Uh, of a very, very uh, exciting presentation we had last week on uh, lab, uh, lab systems and viral load issues. Uh, Sister Mwamba. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Mm, I'm Evelyn Mwamba, my coordinator for, for ECHO. Last week, the topic was on, a quick recap of last week's topic was on laboratory services in context of HIV and TB care. It was presented by Madame Mutinta Shisholeka. Quality assurance is a holistic process, not dependent on one cadre. It involves pre-examination, which includes the community volunteers, nurses, doctors, and the lab. Examination, it is the lab. Post-examination, it involves the lab, the data clerks, and the nurses. It was discussed in a meeting in, in that session that Ministry of Health has developed some SOPs, which must be followed to describe the procedure in full details, starting from receiving of the sample, pre-processing, 
Processing samples, quality control measures to be followed, validation of the final results of the test, entering and transmission of results in the laboratory information management system and receiving the results. Then it was also discussed that it is important to give feedback at the end of the process. So when the results are received, the end, the end users must give feedback to our clients. Thank you so much. That is what was discussed, just a summary of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Mamba. I think that was a very important session. We were able to pick out quite a number of issues, especially uh, uh, regarding the, the need for everybody to be involved in, in terms of quality assurance and just understanding some of the is issues surrounding the lab system, the turnaround time for, for the different uh, barrel loads, the EID, the DBS, the barrel load, the the genotype and when we expect those to come out. So thank you very much, Sister Mamba. Uh, before we move on to our didactic presentation this afternoon, I just want to recognize Dr. Mwanza Wamwanza, who will be one of the experts for this afternoon, and also uh, Mr. Terence uh, Sians Lama. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, at this time, I will now invite uh, Dr. James Simpungwe. Please uh, do go ahead and share your slides, and uh, you may pick it up and take a deep dive into what we are discussing this afternoon. Dr. Simpungwe. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ziambo. And once again, um, a good afternoon to you all. Um, as has been said, my name is James Simpungwe. Uh, I work in the prevention, care, and treatment branch at the CDC, uh, where I coordinate quality um, assurance and quality improvement. Th thank you, Dr. Simpungwe. I think you might want to get draw closer to your mic. Uh, yeah, it's on a bit distant. Okay, can you hear me better now? Um, far much better now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. We'll proceed with our presentation. Um, and I hope that you can all see the slides. Uh, our learning objectives for, for this afternoon um, are threefold. The first is we want to be able to review some of the quality improvement and quality assurance systems, as well as tools that we use in the TBHIV program in our country. And we also want to highlight the role of quality management systems and how it is that they relate to HIV epidemic control, which is the thing that you know, all of us are here for. And finally, we will highlight um, the importance of the use of data as a key element of program quality management. So getting straight um, into it, um, as a way of a background, um, issues around quality, I think, um, um, have been discussed at length on many, on many platforms. And the word itself, quality, is one that we, we throw around quite, quite often in our work as, as public health officials. And I think it's important for purposes of the HIV program for us to be able to really define what we mean when we, when we, when we say quality. And when we draw from uh, the definition that the World Health Organization uses, quality really is the extent to which the, pro the, the, the healthcare services that we provide to individuals and populations um, achieve the desired outcomes. So it's basically the degree to which we are able to achieve that which we have set out to achieve as far as patient care is concerned, as, as far as um, the health of the client populations that we are looking at is concerned. So when you look at this definition from the World Health Organization, it is designed um, with some key principles embedded in there. And I put those principles in, the slide, in, in this slide there. They say the, the first one is around safety. And what we are saying is that as we, as we seek to, to realize desired patient outcomes, desired uh, recipient of care outcomes, we must do it in an environment that is as safe as possible, minimizing risks and harm to service users. 
we are also saying that in that in that definition of quality the service has got to be effective so what we mean by this is that the service that we provide must be to the extent possible based on scientific knowledge as well as on evidence based guidelines it also has to be timely you know reducing delays in providing this service that we're talking about also is a is a key principle in the idea of quality um, healthcare delivery issues around efficiency as you know we we will not you know we will never get to a point where we will say we have sufficient resources to provide care and so the, the 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 this principle becomes important in the definition of quality that we must maximize the use of the little resource we have without you know putting anything to waste and this resource is not just in reference to um, to financial resources but also even to other resources such as human resources for health we have got to maximize the, 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 the little resource that we have in order for us to realize those health outcomes. It has to be equitable. And when we speak about equity, you realize that we, we, we really are quite a distance away from getting to a place where we can say we are providing equitable care, even with, with, with HIV services. So what somebody who lives in Chilenje and um, goes to Chilenje uh, now, Chilenje General Hospital, uh, is able to receive as a package of care can obviously not be compared to somebody say who lives in George and only goes to George Health Center to acquire services. So we must get to a place at least as the service package is as equitable as it as it can. And finally, uh, the principle of people centeredness. For a long time, our service um, has been provider centered because we you know we, we we base it on the fact that look we have we we, we have this uh, scientific knowledge this evidence based um, you know guidelines in our practice and we end there without considering how it is that the recipient of care would like to receive that care while it may be evidence based while it it may be based on scientific knowledge there is this component of 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 patient centeredness that if we do not address is causing significant barriers in the quality of care that we're providing, particularly as we, as we speak to, to HIV care. So that is, that is how the World Health Organization defines quality um, in healthcare provision. So basically, um, in trying to summarize that the US Agency for Health and Care Research and Quality defines you know, quality as uh, you know, doing the right thing at the right time in the right way in order for us to be able to achieve uh, the best possible results. Now, the use of the word right in that definition implies that we must, we must describe what it is that is right. Because when you say that this thing has been done right, then there's a possibility for it to be done wrong. And if there's that possibility of right and wrong, then we should have standards. We should have a, 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 a method that we use to measure those standards, to measure adherence to those standards. Then we'll be able to understand what you know, we define as quality. So we're basically looking at two graphs, two line graphs. One line graph is saying, this is what we know how to do. And the other line graph is saying, this is how we're actually doing it. And between the no line graph and the, the, the actuality line graph, there's a gap in between there that we, we have got to, to fill, to close. And that's precisely what then we, we mean by quality. And this, this has got to be contextualized in the work that we do um, in HIV. So the Ministry of Health, um, as we know, does have uh, what, are, what are called the national QI, QA guidelines. These were launched a couple of years ago, and, and it is my hope that these documents are now flooded in the health facilities, and that as we are implementing service delivery in the different programs, not just HIV, we are making reference to, these, to this particular uh, tool. Uh, there's a goal in there, in the, in the national quality improvement, in, in the national QI, QA guidelines, which states as follows, to create and support a culture of improvement throughout the ministry, supporting healthcare providers to be able to deliver the highest quality care. So again, this is after we have defined what we mean by quality, right? That it is, it is, it is the extent to which we are able to produce the desired health outcomes in our patient populations. And the goal of, of, of the Minister of Health is to then create a situation where the culture of improvement is inculcated in the work that healthcare 
providers do on a daily basis. This, this fits um, very well with what uh, PEPFAR's focus is on quality management, which is really to institutionalize quality assurance and quality improvement, to bring it to a place where it is not regarded as an external program, something that is that should only be pushed by the QIQA officer, but it should be something that should be uh, core business for all um, health practitioners in all our health facilities. So this is what the Ministry of Health has as a, um, a guideline for quality assurance and quality improvement work um, in our country. So we'll move on to our first um, poll question. And I will, I will read it out before it, it's, uh, it, it, it's uploaded by Dr. Kozia over there. Question says, quality assurance is the process of engaging appropriate methodologies and quality management tools to close the gap between current and expected levels of quality. Is that true or false? Thank you very much, Dr. Simpung. We're very exciting so far, bringing out and what it's all about. We think is the true answer here, or which one is the correct answer? Is it true, or is it a false that quality assurance is a process of engaging appropriate methodologies and quality management tools to close the gap between current and expected levels of quality? Is that true or false? Uh, the simple way that uh, uh, developed here. And so far, we have about 55% uh, 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 people who are eligible to vote that have voted. Uh, we'll give you uh, 10 more seconds before we end the poll. Okay. So, sure. thank you very much, everybody, for for participating. I will end the poll. Uh, Dr. Simpung, you. you can see how they voted. That's how we have voted. Yeah. The thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozia. Um, yeah. Thank yeah, you. The, the, thank the, you, Dr. The voting Kozia. pattern has given uh, justification the for us to have this, given this study today. Uh, justification for um. Dr. Kozi, I'm hearing myself, is it? Okay, it's better now. Okay, so um, I'll move along to the next slide so that then we can help, we can, we can reflect on our answers um, on this question. 90% felt that that, um, that statement was true. So quality assurance by definition is really a systematic process of monitoring and evaluating different aspects of either a project or a program, for instance, in our case, the HIV program. But the main focus of quality assurance is to ensure that minimum standards of quality are met. I wish I had highlighted that, um, that line in... Okay, I'm not sure. Are you able to hear me, Dr. Kozia? Yes, we can hear you. I know that some people haven't muted their mics. Oh, I see. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So, so indeed, quality assurance is a, is a systematic process of, of, of providing M&D for a project or a program. But the essence of quality assurance is to ensure that minimum standards are being met. And that's why the word assurance is put in there, is because when you look at a project or a program, you want to be able to assure that when I go to Chilenje Level 1 Hospital, for instance, or when I go to, to, to Lewanika General Hospital, for instance, I will find in, in the ART clinic that minimum standards of care are being met. And that is what is going to assure the fact that Lewanika General Hospital is able to provide a service that can be referred to as a quality service. I'll skip quality control and go to quality improvement. Whereas quality assurance is the process of making sure that you understand, you, 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 making sure that you are certain that a, a facility or a program is meeting minimum standards. Quality improvement is then the process of making sure that you push a facility, a program or a project from a current level of service delivery to where they are expected to be at. 
that's a very uh, important difference uh, in 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 um, definition to understand because at some point you you will see that these two elements are mutually exclusive you cannot have quality assurance and end there you you it, it is it is closely interwoven with processes of quality improvement and overarching these processes is a system called then quality control we see this very strong in the in the in the laboratory systems uh, where they do a lot of quality control processes to make sure that we are getting accurate results for the tests that we are running that is an interwoven process that involves making sure that standards in the lab are met so the lab has got the the you know adequate um, 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 equipment to do the tests that they need to do um, and at the same time they are putting in what needs to be put in to make sure that they reach a level where they can be able to meet the expected results of quality so i hope that then you are thinking about the question that was asked in the first poll question which was referring to meeting minimum standards so that is quality assurance you cannot expect a facility to provide um, a quality service when they have not met certain minimum expectations. For example, if um, you, you, you want a facility to provide good quality, say in um, HIV testing services, there are minimum expectations that you, you, you will define as a program to say that this facility needs to have X number of healthcare workers, X number of community healthcare workers. They should have X number of testing kits. They should have X number of, of, of tools to record. And that set of, of minimum standards and the process of checking that they have those minimum standards is what we refer to as quality assurance. If then they have those minimum standards, but they're still not producing the results you expect, then there is a process of quality improvement that you need to implement to get them to the level where you desire them to be. And so this schematic I'm showing now is basically explaining what the relationship is between quality assurance quality improvement so you have a quality um, assurance um, circle at the top left there where you're making sure that minimum standards are met and when those minimum standards are met then you get into a process of continuous quality improvement where you see from program data that things are not going well you input interventions that push you back up to where you're supposed to be um, and i'll give examples as we as we as we as we go on um, and so we've come to, to, to our next polling question, and I'll read it out here. Um, our next polling question is saying, the following are quality assurance tools, except, and I hope that you know, it will become um, more clear now after, after we went through this previous explanation. So the following are quality assurance tools, except A, the site improvement through monitoring systems tool, the SIMS tool, B, service quality assessment tools, C, the Pareto matrix, and D, the HPCZ accreditation tool. Over to you, Dr. Ziam. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, uh, points that you've just highlighted. Yes, indeed. Uh, dear colleagues, let's speak which one here is not uh, saying the following are quality assurance tools quality assurance tools, except uh, site improvement through monitoring uh, systems at the SIMS 2, uh, service quality assessment 2, is it the Pareto matrix or is it the HPCZ accreditation 2? The following are quality assurance tools except. So far, we've got some people that are already polling and uh, most people think C is the correct answer. And uh, a few more think D, others think it's A. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues here in the, in the hub to hear what their choice will be. I can hear that some whispering. What's, what's the answer? C. C, okay. There's an overwhelming C here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we'll be able to, to see which one is the correct one. Okay, five more seconds, then we move on to the next slide. Okay, thank you so much for participating. I will end the poll. Then uh, just share with you how uh, the voting pattern was. So, Dr. Simpungwe, please, you can pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozia. Um, 
Yeah, 27% think that the HPCZ accreditation tool is not a QA tool, okay? Yeah. Let's, let's see how this goes. <clears throat> so, um, having had explained what quality assurance is about, which is basically about making sure, ascertaining that there is adherence to minimum standards. I've put in this slide examples of what we use in the HIV program in Zambia as quality assurance tools. And, and I must say here that there are many more beyond these but I just picked these as examples to help us understand this. The first is the service quality assessment tools. Now these are Ministry of Health tools. Uh, the, ministry, the Ministry of Health has, has come up with what are called service quality assessment tools across all programs, not just HIV, but across all programs. And the essence of these tools is to really ascertain adherence at facility level to what the ministry has defined as minimum uh, standards for us to be able to provide quality services. So these service quality assessment tools um, are, are developed um, with different domains. So they have a domain for um, they have a domain for equipment where they check uh, in every program area if the health facility has adequate equipment to provide that service. They have a domain for practices. Under practices is where you find things like does the facility have guidelines to provide this service and so on and so forth. There's a domain in there for equipment, medical equipment. Does the facility have adequate equipment to provide so and so service? Um, there's a domain for HRH. So under each of those domains, you find set standards that are given um, and, and, and then a facility is assessed to, to determine if they are meeting those standards. On the right side, you see um, you see a picture inserted in there um, of the service quality um, the service quality assessment tools. When you have when you have administered this tool at a facility, you are able to produce a dashboard, which which has those colors in there: dark green, light green yellow and red and obviously you know we understand what those colors mean the, the the more you go down to light green yellow red it means the facility is not meeting the required standard to to provide the service and so when you go to a facility and you find that they are not meeting the bare minimum you do you you should not even begin to discuss quality improvement projects because already what you're saying is that this facility should not even be providing this service because they don't meet the bare minimum requirements for them to, to provide what we have defined as a, as a sector, as a quality service. The site improvement through monitoring systems, SIMS, um, is, is, is something that is used by PEPFA to also um, measure adherence to minimum quality standards. Many of you have seen the SIMS tool. This is something that uh, we have shared widely. It's used across the country in all facilities that are supported by PEPFA, uh, just to check um, adherence to minimum standards. And when you look on the right side where I'm pointing my cursor there, uh, that is just a summary of the sets that you find in the SIMS tool. So it talks about commodity ma uh, management, data quality, care and treatment for adults, care and treatment for PEDS, HI, um, PMTCT, HIV exposed infants, testing services, TB services, lab services, even blood safety services. So it's a requirement for all PEPFA supported facilities to, to undergo an assessment using this site improvement through monitoring um, um, systems, otherwise known as SIMS. We know the PA uh, tool, we've been using this in our country for a long time. That too is a quality assessment tool. The HPCZ accreditation standards, I, I, I noticed that um, um, about 27% of the, of the network thought that these are not quality assurance tools. In fact, they are because the HPCZ has defined minimum standards that they have said every facility that is providing ART services should meet. And this also uh, goes according to different domains, which I'm sure we all know about. In fact, uh, I believe Dr. Amwanza can share more light on this because he has sat on that committee before. Uh, it's not just the general provision of ART that they provide accreditation for, but even for um, um, sub services in the HIV like VMMC, all those require accreditation. There are some program specific QA systems. I mentioned that the lab is one such area that has a lot of um, quality control systems that are, um, are used to ensure that the, the services provided in there 
uh, of a desired quality. So these are examples of quality assurance tools. And I hope that as we are discussing this, we are thinking as mentors, um, asking ourselves the questions, the facilities that we are supporting, to what extent do they actually meet this minimum requirement uh, to be able to, to, to provide quality service? And, and, and what we encourage here is for facilities to not wait for an external assessment to be done, to not wait for the PHO or for the, the IP that is, that is supporting your site to come and do these assessments. These are things that can be done at, indivi at individual facility level, self-assessments. In fact, the way that the performance assessments used to be done, I'm not sure how they are done now, is that a facility would be required to self-assess themselves. And then the external team will just come and assess that self-assessment. That self-assessment is not so that you pass a test from outside, but the importance is for you to understand whether you actually, uh, you know, are, are meeting the standards that that will help you to perform um, adequately. And where you are not, in many cases, the individual facility may not have the resources to 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 make amends or to to provide what is required, and that is where the higher level offices come in. So we've dwelt a bit on the Q. A, and I'm moving along quickly to QI, uh, because this is what we like to talk about a lot, you know, QI, quality improvement. And we run very quickly into doing QI projects. Uh, you know, we have so many QI projects going on in this country. And um, really, many times we find ourselves starting at a baseline of 40% and ending at, at 45% because we, we have ignored the QA part of it, that, that quality assurance bit, which is important. And it's, you know, these things are not mutually, are, are not, they cannot exist on their own. So for quality improvement, quality improvement basically um, involves a process of regular data review and analysis. That helps you understand, that helps you look at uh, the, the, the status of a project or a program from a cross-sectional um, uh, viewpoint, and it helps you to determine where the problems are. So some of the things that, some of the tools that you find involved in quality improvement are things like root cause analysis tools, things like flowcharts, the fishbone analysis, the, the Y trees, all of, all of these things are things we've looked at, we have been trained in uh, one too many times. It involves issues of selecting projects based on the data that you'd have looked at and putting in interventions, using the Pareto charts. The Pareto charts just help you to determine which one is the intervention you must go for out of a number of interventions that you have put up. The prioritization matrices, project decision matrices, and so on and so forth. The work that we're doing now uh, that Dr. Kozia and Dr. Uh, Folosha are leading out in, this process of us coming every Monday to look at, to, to do didactics, then look at cases, and then determine what the problems are and then get feedback for improvement. That also is a process of continuous quality improvement. Uh, and it is, it is being done on, on, the, on, on, on the assumption that facilities have what it takes to do quality service. What we want now is just to provide support for that service to move from where it is to where we desire it to be. The process of implementing tested change packages is also a part of continuous quality improvement. You've heard of things like the retention package or the pediatrics change package. Um, all of those, the implementation of those things are what we refer to as continuous quality improvement. On the right, I just give you examples. On the top there is a table that summarizes a process that we call granular site management, which is basically looking at data with different key stakeholders, identifying program challenges and implementing uh, interventions that will help uh, improve. On the bottom is a, is, a, is a snapshot I got from one of our situation room meetings where we look closely at different age groups to see how they are attending uh, their appointment, they're meeting their appointments, those that are missing their appointments, how the tracking is being done, and to see if there are challenges in those areas and how they can be improved. So this slide here just tells you in a snapshot the differences between quality assurance and quality improvement, whereas quality assurance measures the performance against standards. It's a snapshot of, of, of what is going on at the facility. Quality improvement employs scientific methods to then make sure that we, we move from where we are to where we need to be. This is a schematic that shows you, again, the differences between quality assurance and quality improvement. On the left is a dashboard that is produced after a SIMS assessment is done uh, at a facility somewhere in Kenya. 
And you can see under care, these are the sets that I had showed you earlier on. And you can see that under care and treatment, uh, this proportion of, of, of um, standards are in red, this proportion are in yellow, and this proportion are in light green, and this proportion is in dark green. And then the facility goes back to, to look at the ones that are in red, light, uh, yellow, and light green, and they ask the question, what is it that we need to do for us to be able to meet this standard? Do we need to have more community-based healthcare workers? Do we need to make sure that we have more efficacious drugs available at the site? Do we need to make sure that we are following, we have treatment guidelines available and are being used by all the healthcare workers? That is how quality assurance works. Whereas quality improvement now seeks at moving uh, program performance from baseline to where we desire it to be. Talking about use of data for quality improvement as we, uh, we are coming slowly to the end, uh, here we see that collecting and analyzing data are a central function of quality improvement in any healthcare service. Um, if you and I are to be successful at making sure that uh, program quality is improved and sustained, we have got to have a liking for data. We cannot do this work without having a, a, a connection with the data that we are generating. Health facility staff generate data on a daily basis, but I think that the tragedy of it is that they, they, they are the ones perhaps who have the least visibility into the data that they are uh, generating. And, and you can be sure that without visibility into the data that you're generating, quality improvement is not something that you can actually assure. So this whole process of looking at raw data into information, into knowledge that can be called quality improvement, and at every stage of the process, a, a sound understanding of your data is important. So we're moving into our, our last poll question, and I'll read it out here. It says, measuring quality in healthcare involves the use of defined indicators, which help in understanding what is happening in the delivery of health services, factors affecting um, the services, and how they can be influenced to achieve improvement. Is that true or false? Thank you so much, Dr. Simpungwe. Question three, true or false? Measuring quality in health care involves the use of defined indicators which help in understanding what is happening in the, in the delivery of health services, factors affecting the service, and how they can be influenced to achieve the improvement. So, uh, dear network, please go ahead and just uh, post your, uh, your, your answer here. Is this true statement or false? What do we think? Uh, quite a number of uh, uh, points have been highlighted as we have been discussing with Dr. Uh, Simpungwe and uh, still got a few more slides to share with you. What do you think is the correct poll here? You have just 10 more seconds um, to, to, to vote. Okay. Uh, uh, Tim UTH Hub. What do you think? True. It's a true statement. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Sumpungwe, this is how the, the polls have been, the results of the poll. You may pick it up, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozia, thank you. Um, so indeed, um, you know, when we talk about using data for quality improvement, we are basically talking about being able to measure um, the state of the service that we are providing. So we are, it helps us to understand what is happening in that service, to understand what the factors are that um, have either a positive or a negative effect on the service delivery, and finally, how it is that we can influence it for improvement. So when we correctly use data, we, it helps us to be able to tackle the correct problem, implement the correct strategies, demonstrate the required outcomes and monitor for continued improvement. There are many times that we're implementing efforts uh, in, our, in our work in the HIV program, tackling the wrong problem and thereby not producing results because we have not used the data that we're generating with fidelity to determine what the, 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 the challenge is. 
So we use a variety of, we call them a family of indicators. And I, and I adapted this slide from the ICAP QI training package. And we, we, we generally, um, generally uh, classify indicators into these three, the process outcome or balancing indicators. These follow the logic model uh, that we know in public health programming. And so it's important these indicators work. Um, so when you talk about, let's, let's start with process indicators. Uh, you talk, let's say, for instance, percentage of HIV exposed infants who are identified as positive and actually that you collect the facility and the caregiver is informed that the result is back, you need to come back to the facility with the baby for action. That is a process and the health facility needs to have an indicator that can track how that process moves. Um, there's an outcome for that process. And that outcome for the process is so that the, 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 the HIV infant who is, who, the HIV exposed infant who is found to be positive is then initiated on ART. Not only that, but they are initiated on ART as close to the time they are diagnosed as possible. Now we talk about same day uh, initiation. So you see that there are processes that lead to a desired outcome and at every stage we have got to have indicators that give us a snapshot, a cross-sectional picture of how this process, first of all, of, of, of testing is going, of receiving the, the result is going, uh, the process of, of, of tracking the caregiver so that they can come back to the facility with the child is going, and ultimately how we are initiating treatment. And this is what it should be for all other um, systems that we are using in the HIV program. We do have these balancing indicators. These are the type that cause problems. For instance, you know, you can have the EID DBS test kit stock out, or you can have, you know, sometimes you don't have the, the appropriate ART formulation for the child. And we must track these as well. Remember, we said that quality improvement involves understanding the status of your, of your program, understanding the issues that affect it, whether positively or negatively. And these things are not understood qualitatively. Uh, you can understand them qualitatively, but it is more helpful when you quantify them by using um, indicators such, um, such as these. So many times we are, we are unable to, to, to explain what the challenge is because we look at outcomes. We, we see, for example, that, okay, we have a problem at this facility. Uh, EID testing at two months, the proportion of EID testing is very low. And we, we look at it at outcome level, but we forget then to look at it at the process level or at the balancing indicator level. Um, and usually this is where the challenges are that lead to poor outcomes. We are saying that data supports all the phases of the quality improvement cycle. And these stages, I'll skip this slide, I'll use this one instead. And these are the stages that we find in the quality improvement cycle. First of all, you have to have a, a definition um, of the problem. You, you have to define what the problem is. And many a times we are spending resources, time and effort in tackling problems which are not actually problems. Uh, okay, uh, when, we, when we make, when we call for, for facilities to do quality improvement projects, you find a project to, Im to, to improve something from 96% to 98%, uh, you know, and, and, and resources are spent, uh, um, time is spent to, to improve something from 96% to 98%. Um, it's not, it's not, it's because at the, at the, at the project definition phase, we would not have used our data with fidelity to determine which, which problems are actually having a negative impact on our, on our, on our program. The diagnosis phase is the phase where we begin, first of all, to diagnose the root causes of that problem using data and also to, to, to determine what interventions we feel are going to produce the desired impact that we want. When we go into the intervention phase, you see that there are cycles there that are going and going and going. What that is saying is that in the science of quality improvement, you do not run with one intervention and stick with that one intervention. Sometimes you can start an intervention today, review your data after a month and you discover it is not helping. You drop it, you do, you do some more diagnosis, determine another intervention, start that cycle again. When you discover that that intervention is producing results, um, you then add that intervention to what we call a tested change package, because now you know that this one works. And so it becomes important when you are, in, when you are, when you are introducing a test change that you track it to see 
its its impact on program data. And that's why we are saying that you need data at every single stage of the quality improvement cycle. Um, so in terms of sustaining improvement, these are the questions that must be asked. What trends are occurring over time? What trends are occurring over time? Why is it that we're having low proportion of AID testing at two months? Is it, is it you know, what, what do we see happening frequently? Maybe it's, it's, it's the long term, the trend of having turnaround time of four weeks. We keep seeing that. Or maybe it's, it's because, you know, uh, when children come, we, we, we keep seeing that human resource that is capable of collecting that DBS sample is, is lacking. You need to be able to track those trends so that they can help you to put in the appropriate intervention. Is there a need for repeated intervention? I, I, I talked about this. Sometimes certain interventions, we start them one month, two months, three months, they're not producing change. We need to drop them and begin to, to come up with new interventions. Have improved processes been integrated into routine practice? This is where we're talking about the test change packages. And, and, and we must measure the extent to which we are making routine the things that we see are working. And what else do you need to do to achieve quality in that area? So this is my last slide and it's basically speaking to the key messages for our presentation um, today. Quality relates to the degree to which desired outcomes are realized. So if you are to define quality, you must define your baseline where you are, you must define where you want to go and the degree then to which you, you, you are reaching that desired outcome is, is, is what quality is going to be defined by. Quality assurance and quality improvement, these are, cannot exist independent of each other. Once you are certain that a facility meets the minimum standards to produce the quality you want, then you can do your continuous quality improvement activities. The use of data with fidelity is a foundation and it's a key driver for the quality improvement processes data must be used to understand the state of the program the gaps that are in the program and how it is that that can be improved and finally quality management must be regarded as core business for all stakeholders in service um, delivery um dr ziambo this is my last slide so i, I believe we can review the polls now yes sure thank you very much that was an excellent presentation very very uh, clear slides and uh, clear polls that you have shared with every one of us. I'm sure a number of questions have been answered and uh, a number of perceptions have been corrected. Uh, uh, that QI, QA are mutually exclusive. You can't do one without the other. And that some of the QI projects we've had maybe have fallen because of the way we have not really looked at our indicators very well, whether it's a process, balancing or is it an outcome indicator? Very, very important points that you brought up for us, Dr. Simpungwe. Uh, we'll just run through quickly the poll questions before we invite uh, people to, to, ask the, to, uh, to ask questions. So I will read here, I've just shared the, the poll. Uh, quality assurance is a process of engaging appropriate methodologies and quality management tools to close the gap between current and expected levels of quality. Now, after the presentation, what do you think is the correct answer here? <laughs> which one is true, which one is false? Uh, so far, it's balancing. Mm -hmm. like, Balancing is better. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. Uh, it's going to 50. I know, I know Dr. Simpungwe, uh, most of us are probably a bit lost on uh, uh -huh. So thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone, for, for polling. Uh, and I know, I think, Dr. Simpungwe, you would have to say quite a bit on this one. Yeah. I know most people uh, didn't quite quite catch it. Maybe I see that, yeah. The opportunity to just uh, re-emphasize uh, that That's right, aspect yeah. of QA, QA and uh, QI. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kozia. I take comfort in the fact that the, the proportions at least have 
improve there was 90 there was 90 percent at the beginning that thought this was true but now it's just 60 percent this is a false statement um and it is false because it is referring to quality assurance as a process that is aimed at closing the gap between current and expected levels of quality that is not the role of quality assurance the role of quality assurance is just to ascertain that this particular project this facility this program meets the minimum standards that it, it, it requires for it to be able to, to provide a quality service. The process yeah. of trying to move a program from current to expected is what we call continuous quality improvement. Um, so that yeah. is the explanation for, for, for that. Yeah, yeah. And I think just to enhance what you've said, I think the key, the catch thing here is that we are going to do an assessment of the uh, of a, of, of a facility, for example, VMMC, uh, we want to know if they are fit to actually produce, to, right. to offer the service, then we right. are going to, do, to use the quality assurance tools, which are the SQAs, the PA2, the, all those processes, even the HPCZ accreditation, not so. But then if That's we want correct. to see improvement in those processes that produce quality, then we want them to now meet a certain expected target, for example, then that's when we move in with the quality improvement tools, not so. I, I hope correct. that I shed a bit more, more light. Uh, I, and, and I think it will get clear as we have the presentation here by the team from Western province, they are going to share something and we'll be able to see much more clear with practical examples. So I'll quickly share the next poll question. And uh, oh, sorry, I, I need to redo this one. Sorry. Okay, so the next poll question says that the following are quality assurance tools, except uh, this one, I think most people seem to have got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Following, that uh, one was quality assurance well tools, I think uh, you did a very good job on this one. I'll just yeah. end the poll here and just ask yeah. you to run through what you think, uh, what you can just explain. Uh, yeah, no, that's this, 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 the, the network is spot on. Um, Apparato metrics is a part of a continuous quality improvement process. It helps you to um, prioritize interventions that you need to implement. Um, and so that's the, that's, that's the correct answer. All right, thank you so much. We'll move on to the next, to the final poll question. So measuring quality in healthcare involves the use of defined indicators, which help in understanding what is happening in the delivery of health services, factors affecting service delivery and how they can be influenced to achieve uh, improvement. Is this statement true? So run us through this. We've lost connection. Yeah. Yes, that's a simple way. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that again here, uh, you know, the network got this right, 97% um, said it's true. It is indeed true. I just wanted to mention here, Dr. Kozia, that, you know, recently we did a, um, you actually laid out in doing a survey um, where the mentors expressed uh, that the, there was a lot of time that they were putting in into, into uh, collecting data. Um, yeah. Well, while, while that is true, and while we do have dedicated staff whose role is to manage the data, that is to collect and store the data, yeah, we, we should understand that as, as, as public health practitioners, it is our role to then um, process that data from just being data into being information. Yeah. It is not the role of M&D specialists or data associates to do that processing of the data from its raw state into information it is ours because we are the ones then who implement who use our 
Yes, data management in terms of collecting and storing may not be ours, but we must remember that we need to use these indicators to then process data into information. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Simpungwe, um, for the for the for the presentation. And I think that's been very, very helpful. We will now invite the network before, as we ask uh, Western Province to prepare their slides, uh, we'll ask the, the, the network if there are any questions that you have, please go ahead and, uh, and ask at this stage. Pungwe is here on the call, and then uh, uh, Dr. Mwanza Mwanza is also on the call you will be able to respond to some of the questions. Uh, network questions, uh, you have an opportunity to ask now. Please raise your hand if you would like to, to, to make a comment. <laughs> uh, you might, you can use the Uh, it looks like everything was clear. Any questions from the hub here? Anyone with a question? We are all safe? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so um, we'll invite Western Province. Uh, is there a hand? Jeffrey Chikocha. Jeffrey Chikocha. Uh, Chikoti, please go ahead and uh, uh, unmute yourself. You, you can unmute and uh, ask a question. Uh, Jeffrey Chikoti, we can't hear you. Geoffrey. Thank you sir, for giving me this opportunity to give out uh, the word as well. Uh, I would love to get some more clarity though on uh, question number three. I was thinking the answer was true according to how the presentation was. So just the clarity and how forced to be the answer. I think that the answer is true. It is true. Uh, Dr. Simpungwe, we can, uh, you, pick that, you managed to pick that question. I just want to. Um, question number three. Yes, yes, I did. I picked it here. Yeah. Can, I, can I respond to it now? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, the question was saying measuring quality in healthcare involves the use of defined indicators which help us to understand uh, the state of the health service delivery factors affecting it and how they can be influenced. So indeed, the answer is true. Um, and that was how uh, the, the network voted. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. I hope, Geoffrey, you've seen that uh, you are actually, it's as true as you had actually thought it was. So... That's uh, that's correct. Uh, I've seen another hand here. Thank you so very much. Thank you for okay. the clarity. You're welcome. Uh, did somebody else wanted to ask a question before we move on to uh, Western Province? If there's none, then we'll just proceed to Western Province and I'll invite... Um, to go ahead and uh, uh, begin uh, their presentation. And uh, Soseko? Uh, Western province, Soseko. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Sosiku Mangala, uh, a clinical mentor for Mongo District and also the QI focal point person for Mongo. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, the QIC that you are doing in our 
in our district, uh, which is looking at cervical cancer. Okay. So basically, our our statement, our problem statement is we only. But before we implemented our QI project, we only had 8% uh, of our eligible women living with HIV aged between 15 to 49 who were screened for cervical cancer. Next slide. And then this on this slide, just trying to, to show how we are performing as a, as a district on this indicator. As baseline, as a district, we are currently standing at 5% before we started implementing the QI project. And all the nine facilities that we, uh, we enrolled in the QIC, they were standing at 80%. So we, we thought of choosing the nine facility with a high volume, which at least when you implement this QI project in this facility, they contribute to our, to our the number of women living with HIV about 70 to 80%. So we knew that when we implement the QI project in these nine facilities, we're able to, to, to achieve our target. So as currently our district, we are standing at 96%, but the, as those facilities that I enrolled in the QIC, we're standing at 114%. Next, right? So this is this one just trying to, uh, to appreciate the facility that we enrolled in the QIC. So some of the facilities that you see that by the time at the baseline they had zero, by then they were not screening the, the women, but we only had the two facilities, which was Lewanika and Mulambo by then were screening. But as you can see now, Lewanika were already at 270%, Mulambo at over 100%, including Ilioelo and so on. This is how the facilities are performing. And we are currently in the, these nine facilities, we are at 100 14%. So after seeing that we have that challenge in our district for cervical cancer, we came up with our aim statement, which reads that to increase the proportion of women living with HIV aged 15 to 49 screened for cervical cancer in the nine health facilities from 8 November 2022 to 8% from November 2020 to 95% by the end of September 2021 in Mongo district. So this is a fishbone diagram. Uh, when we went through our facilities, we came up with this fishbone diagram. Most of the, the challenge that we found in our facilities was most of them were coming from the knowledge and, and skills, why they had a lot of misconception towards our clients. They had the misconception about wrong inf information about cervical cancer and so on. And also we had the low sensitization done in the communities. People didn't know if these services were offered at our facilities and so on. And also we had inadequate trained staffs in our facilities. And also the other one we had was the, we didn't have any st uh, staffs who were, who were really entering the data correctly in our registers and in smart care. So we, this was one of the challenges that we had. And also in organizations and support, we also had no specific staff who, who used to screen our clients. So these staffs were, were the one we seen here, uh, who were working in MCHA, they would do other duties, but at the same time, again, screen women. So women used to spend a lot of time in the queues. So this one became one of the challenges. Under performance and feedback, we have a uh, uh, lack of uh, integration of cervical cancer data in review meetings. Normally when the facilities have meetings and they never used to include the, the data for cervical cancer in the meetings. When you come to job description, we found, we realized that the facilities are, we had low demand creation in the facilities. We didn't even have um, any IEC materials being displayed on in our facilities. And then when you come to environment and tools, you have a lack of space to provide the cervical cancer services. You find that we are just using the MCH department to screen where they are seeing other women there in most of our facilities. And then we also had ad inadequate uh, equipment in, in these facilities which are offering these services. And we also had lack of privacy, like I mentioned that the same room where they are seeing antenatal women and so on, that's why we used to screen uh, our women. Okay, go to the next slide. 
So they are doing this uh, QIC. These are a uh, family of indicators that we are, we are tracking. Uh, our main indicator, which is the percentage of eligible women living with HIV screened for cervical cancer, which is 15 to 49. And then our process indicators, we are looking at the percentage of eligible uh, clients uh, screened for cervical cancer, also looking at the percentage of screened for cervical cancer, also looking at the percentage of testing positive by, uh, testing positive, also looking at the percentage treated with cryotherapy and the thermo. And then our outcome indicators, we are also looking at uh, then the percentage of screened for cervical cancer and number of clients screened for positive and then number of clients treated for cervical cancer. And then under balance indicator, we are looking at the number of days without the disinfectors. Okay. When you come to this slide, this is our run chart, how we are performing as a district. So as baseline, you can see we're at 8% in October. November, we moved to, to about 18, that was 18%. November, about, about 30 or so. And then January, moved to 35. And then uh, we also moved from 53 to 170. Uh, in January and in, Feb uh, in February, we had uh, a campaign which we screened a lot of clients that made us to raise from 35% to 53%. But the March raise was noticed in, uh, in, in March where we had outreaches, where we had screened a lot of clients and they moved from 53% to, to 170%. And then of note is in, in April, we had a DQMIS where we reviewed our data and tried to analyze it. We dropped our from 170 to, to 114%. Uh, what we used to do here, you find that most of our facilities, the only facility that are screening for cervical cancer, they're just these nine facilities that we have enrolled in the QIC. So these are the same facilities who would provide outreaches to go and screen in other facilities. So we used to get the numbers for those facilities and add them, no wonder you were at 170. But after we had the meeting at the district, we realized that uh, we agreed that let the facilities, even if you are providing outreaches, let them have their own data and just report on the data from this facility we have enrolled in the QIC. No wonder why we dropped from 170 to 14%, 214%, thank you. So these are just the, the, the change package that we tested in our facilities. As you can see, we had inadequate staff that we trained in, in cervical cancer in our district. So in November, we, we trained, we had two groups that we trained. One it was supported by WPHO, and the second training we were supported by ICAP. So after training the, the staff, we realized that we moved from 8% to 13%. And also, and in December, with this. this is one of the challenges that we have with, we never had anyone focal point person to, to carry out these activities. So from the trained staff, we managed to train at least two, two staff per facility. So from the trained staff, we managed to choose one dedicated staff and assign them as a uh, survival cancer focal point person in our facilities. And then we managed to, to, to raise from 13% to 18%. And in, uh, in January, WPHO managed to help us with funds, support the district where we managed to buy adequate equipment that we, we gave out to these uh, facilities for those who, had the, in, who never had the adequate equipment. So we gave them some equipment that were lacking and then it really helped us. We moved from 18% to 35%. And in February, we had an, a campaign and then this, uh, then we moved from 35 to 53%. The outreach that, that we had also moved from 53 to 170 until in April where we have the, our DQMIs. So next slide, I'm just trying to show you how we implemented these change ideas. So on this slide, it just going to show you how we, we implemented these change ideas. So after noticing that we had inadequate training staff in our facilities, so as DS, District Health Office, we engaged WPHO and ICAP to, and we selected uh, 
staff in these facilities and then we asked uh, PHO and uh, ICAP to train these staff which were, we were trained and we had, at least we had about two per, per facility which were trained. And also this issue of um, no specified staff assigned for cervical cancer activities. So what we did in our facility, after these facility, uh, staffs were trained, we chose one person as a focal point person and this focal point person works with other colleagues in the facility and also orients other staff. And then also this focal point person ensures that all the eligible clients that are coming on a daily, on a daily basis to collect drugs, they are screened and fast tracked. And, and this focal point person also makes sure that that list which is generated for women eligible for cervical cancer screening, they are called and given an appointment on a daily basis. And then uh, inadequate uh, equipment, uh, district health uh, office, we conduct an assessment to find out what was really a challenge, what were these facilities lacking, like? find that some facilities never had uh, spotlights, some had broken cameras and so on. So we engaged PHO, which managed to, to procure this equipment and also we managed to open even some new sites because we were given adequate equipment. And then and the facility never used to, we, we look at the activity that we conduct at the facilities. We only waited for clients who were coming at the facility on a daily basis to pick drugs. But we realized that no, we need to conduct a campaigns that will run at least a week or two. So we conducted this uh, uh, campaign whereby we generated the list and then called all the client to come at the facility from eight hours to 16 hours. So we managed to screen a lot of uh, clients. And then the other one activity that we conducted was the outreach. So this uh, outreach, the way we conduct it, we have our health policy, health policy in our catchment areas. So we call the clients, we give them appointments, some will come to the main facility to be screened. Some of those who fail will go in the committee at the health post that we have in, the, in our catchment areas. We screen them from there. At least when we had this, this outreach, actually, it really worked for us. A lot of people, the marketeers, those health posts that are, are within the, the markets and so on, and a lot of uh, marketeers and other people were flocking to come and be, get screened. Yes, of not, yes, we would realize that some people from other facilities come to get screen, screened, but would do document the information separate and then just pick from those coming from, uh, from our facility and the document. And then those others from other facilities will give the, the names to the facility they are coming from. And then this marks the end of our, our presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Susiko. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, we really appreciate the work that you've put in and the best practice that you have shared. So at this opportunity, I just want to invite uh, for comments uh, from the network. If you have got any comments, any questions, any clarifications you want to make around uh, this presentation. I hope now everything is, is coming into shape it's knitting together we'll have some comments from dr mwanza wamwanza and we'll have some comments from dr simple as they try and apply the didactic to what has been presented today so that we can get something from here dr wamwanza i've seen you've raised your hands please go ahead and uh, unmute yourself yes good afternoon doc. thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, maybe before I make uh, a comment, I would like to clarify from the Mongo team, how did they go to 114%? How did they uh, calculate that 114 and what did they use as denominator so that it's clear for the network? Thanks, over to you. Thank you so much. So Siku, would you like to just uh, clarify on that one? I think it's an important aspect. We need to understand what we used as your denominator. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Omanza. As the information that you see on the run chart is just for the facility that I enrolled in the QIC. So as of for March, we are 270, like I later said, because we used to include uh, the information from 
other facilities that we use to conduct outreaches to those facilities that are not screening. But as of March, if we drop from 172 to 114 percent, because we now we just revive, uh, have a DQAMS, we realize that we just have to be reporting on the, the numbers from the facility. So the, the denominator that you are using, we have aggregated the targets that were given for. We got all, you aggregated the target for the, this percent facility in the device, which target that one we can see there, which is uh, 2,560. And then the numerator is the, number of women eligible for cervical cancer that we screened in these facilities. That's what gave us our, our target. But as you can see, the district target is 4,446. That's a target for the district. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Mwanza, I don't know if that is uh, better. It has given clarity and uh, we'll be able to make some uh, comments. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I wanted uh, him to explain. Uh, usually, whenever we have got a percentage that is above 100%, it is always very important to explain what uh, uh, the denominator is uh, being used so that everyone uh, understand uh, what, what, what is happening. And that is very important as uh, uh, the Simpungwe said, data is one of uh, 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 key parameters when uh, we talk about uh, quality insurance and quality improvement uh, activities. Yes, I'm seeing there is a, a lot of people would like to ask the question. I would speak last when. Uh, we oh, started. okay. All right. Uh, we will allow St. Francis Hospital, and then after that, then Mimi can make a comment. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, so sir. This is Sylvester Munja at St. Francis. Please go ahead. Chat on. Uh, we, St. Francis, uh, we, we uh, we seem to have had lost uh, connection. Maybe would you just kindly beam the fishbone diagram just for us to be able to comment on the same? All right. Please go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, I've noticed that on the motivation and incentives, um, I think it's quite blank, but I thought that maybe there are certain things that could have been added there. Um, for example, under the knowledge and skills, um, there's that point of having a inadequate uh, trained staff. I think that maybe under motivation and incentives, we could have had something like maybe lack of uh, trainings or workshops or something because actually that's what even came uh, to be used afterwards where they trained more stuff and then things that they are becoming better in, in uh, December. So I think maybe they should have added uh, trainings, a lack of trainings and workshops and uh, motivation and incentives. I feel so. Mm -hmm. Another question on the um, demographics. If you go back to uh, the chart that is showing how the facilities are performing. Yes, uh, is it this one? No, 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 go backwards. There's another slide that is showing uh, demographics with regards to percentages, apart from the one that you had dimmed. I don't know. I, I had seen it at the beginning. I can't see it anymore. 
Anyway, my, my main question was, um, I noticed those uh, facility. Should I be, ah, yes, that one, that's the same one. Mm -hmm. it's, oh yes, yes, it is the one actually, yes. Um, I've noticed this one, is it Ilute Rural Health uh, Center or something? Um, it seems to be uh, slacking behind from the other facilities. Um, what could have been the challenges that you've noticed from that same facility and why is it slacking behind? I mean, we've seen others going to as far as 270%. I don't know how that was calculated though, but yeah, I mean, if others are progressing, what challenges have they seen in this particular facility and what are they doing so far to actually improve it? Otherwise, besides that, I think the, the project they did was actually tremendous. I mean, I've never seen such percentages before. So if they managed to hit that, then really things really worked out. And this was a very good uh, project that they're in. Thank you. Thank you very much for those valuable comments. Uh, uh, Susiko, would you like, and your team, would you like to respond to uh, just a few comments? I know one of them on the fishbone, those are just uh, comments, but maybe you could speak to the, maybe the law performance relative to the others but of course it's an it's an improvement from zero to 39 but maybe you could just explain what could be the existing uh, challenges at the moment maybe your project hasn't even completed uh, the cycle uh, make a comment please thank you okay thank you very much and thank you mr sylvester for your comment for well, under the motivation on the fishbone diagram that one you noted we look into that but coming to the facility, Ilote, it seems to be not be doing fine. And the, I can answer that with, I can add also the facility like uh, Mongo District Hospital as, as well. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, for Ilote, actually this is a facility which is mostly hit in terms of uh, space. Actually, this is not a clinic, it's a health post, but it has a, a high, it's a high volume site. We have. A, uh, over 1,700 clients there. So they just have one building with two prefabs, which are used for ART. But in terms of conducting the activity for screening for cyber cancer, it's just they're using it in MCH. So the challenge that we have at this facility, they're not uh, screening on a daily basis because at first we had issues of privacy that we just have a screen that is separating the general population from MCH and the women they're screening. So they complain that there's no privacy. So we give them an afternoon time to, to be screened, to be screened. So I find that this is why we have a challenge by only a few clients would come in the afternoon to be screened. But as for now, there's a room that we are working on that will be given specifically for survival cancer. I think that would help me, it will help the facility for for district hospital, they lacked behind as well because at later point they had a, their camera stopped working. And these, they also had the challenge with the spotlight, they never had the spotlight, so it was reached a, a big challenge for them to, to screen. That's why they're still lagging behind, but we are still just on the middle of our project. I think by the time we reach September, should have, we will have a good result from these facilities. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I saw a hand from Mimi. Mimi, would you like to make your comment? Mimi? Yes, please unmute yourself and uh, make your comment. Atonda. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon, thank you. We can hear you. Well, we, we slightly had a network challenge, but my concern is still on privacy, as uh, uh, shown on the fishbone on the fishbone diagram. I would like to find out what uh, um, are they doing specifically on, on space, perhaps to, to provide privacy to, to the to the patients, because we've not had anything in relation to that in the in the, the solutions found, I submit. 
Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Susiko, can you quickly respond to that? We've run out of time though. I can just make a quick comment. Okay, thank you. Um, apart from the nine facilities, we have at least managed to have four facilities which have worked on the privacy, but the other facilities like the same Ilote, Mulambwa, um, Rioelo, and so on, these facilities still have a chance because they're still using the same room for MCH, uh, that's why I'm still screening. But um, there's a, uh, the rooms that you are waiting for, like for Lioelo, they are constructing uh, some, some rooms for adolescent. So the adolescent, when they are going to move from the room that they're using, that's why they're going to take our services there. For Mulamba, there's a prefab that is being put for ART. So there's be an extra room that well, we are conducting ART now, they'll move to prefabs. At least that one actually to help us as well. Even the other facility, the prefabs that you are waiting for, to at least that will help us in privacy. Thank you so much. At least we can uh, see that you are working on that privacy issue. Uh, Dr. Wanza, we are remaining with a few minutes. Uh, maybe you could uh, just uh, make a comment on uh, the presentation that was given here. Uh, they shared with us the problem statements, the aimed statements, uh, the change ideas they implemented, and the targets they wanted to reach, and uh, and how far they have gone so far. Maybe you can speak to that, Dr. Monza. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Wanza. Uh, I'm going to opportunity. And uh, thanks uh, to the Mongo team that has done the presentation. And uh, actually, cervical cancer is one of uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, area of interest as the ART program. So cervical cancer is uh, one of the important area in the management of our HIV uh, uh, patients. So the presentation was well done. Uh, the identification of the problem as, uh, as well as for the facility that were involved in uh, uh, these uh, activities. Actually, you could see that you had, uh, we had a set of activities that were not doing fine. Then there were some activities that were doing uh, better compared to others. Over the last, all the facilities, they had uh, cervical cancer screening as the major uh, problem. So yeah, when they talk to, when they talk about the root cause, that is very important. They try to bring some of the issues that could uh, explain the underperformance. And I like the comment on the motivation and incentive of staff, because yeah. sometimes this uh, staff can be trained, but they are not interested in uh, providing uh, service uh, provision. Then. Uh, issue related to privacy that also raised, uh, are very important. Actually, they are part of uh, the HPCZ accreditation when it comes to uh, service uh, provision. So those two comments were really very important and I feel that they need to be included in uh, uh, the root cause analysis so that as a team, they can uh, address those uh, issues. Uh, I can say that we are uh, I'm impressed, uh, impressed with the result uh, so far. They have achieved 114, that is very good. And uh, I would really uh, recommend that if they could uh, uh, scale up uh, this uh, QI project even to other facilities where we are not doing well in terms of uh, cervical cancer. And uh, there is a need uh, for uh, best practices to be shared across the province, across the facilities, so that uh, yeah. uh, we could also meet uh, uh, the results uh, as a district and at facility uh, level. So exchange visits uh, is very important in terms of uh, uh, improving the performance so that other facilities uh, can also learn from uh, the facility doing fine. So basically, that's the comment I can make in terms of uh, the Mongo presentation. Thanks. Over very, to you. Very, very, very important comments, Dr. Manza. We, we, we appreciate uh, your expertise on that. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Simpungwe, 
any 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 concluding remarks on this topic and maybe just how now you can just uh, highlight some of the clarifying points on what QA, QI is uh, regarding this presentation. Uh, where was the issue at this, and what level was this, was the challenge? Was the process outcome or balancing level uh, in terms of indicators? Uh, maybe you can make a comment on that, Dr. Simpongo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozia. And I also wish to thank Dr. Wamwanza. Um, I think he has touched on some of the things I wanted to, to, to touch on in my, my remarks. Um, I just want to start by saying, you know, cervical cancer um, performance in Western province at the beginning of this fiscal year was on the low. Uh, we didn't start the year on, a, on, on good footing. Um, and it is efforts like this that have seen us um, improve significantly. Uh, to, to, to where we are today. The idea of doing quality improvement collaborative projects is one that we are trying to encourage um, as opposed to just doing solitary QI projects in one facility. Um, why this is helpful is that it, it, if you pick several facilities and ask them to do the same project, it helps in scaling up the interventions to the rest of the province uh, because those different facilities you would have picked um, help you to get, um, to a certain degree, a, a representation of what the province um, issues are. So if you do a project in one facility, some of the factors that affect service delivery in that facility may not affect another facility, which is in another district. But if you pick several districts and then you, you pick facilities, do the same project, you have better context within which you can understand the problems and also you can share those interventions with other facilities because you've widened your context um, in that regard. So I'm happy to see that this project was not just a solitary project, but it was a collaborative in nine facilities. Um, I also um, note that when they did the diag when they were in the diagnosis phase, um, first of all, they dis they used data with fidelity to determine what the problem was, and it was indeed a, a justifiable problem, something that was worthy of an of an improvement effort. Uh, going to the analysis of the problem, you can see very clearly that um, many of these facilities, the nine facilities, did not meet the minimum requirements for them to be able to actually provide cervical cancer services. They didn't have staff. They didn't have trained staff. They didn't have uh, space. They didn't have equipment. So when you are looking at it from a program management level and you see that the cervical cancer screening levels are as low as 8%, you cannot begin to, 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 to think about how we're going to push this up when you actually don't have the very basics that you need to run the program itself. They didn't yeah. have those things. So they had the problem at quality assurance level. Uh, okay. And when they started to then work on the trainings, the space and the equipment, you see that the numbers started to go up. It's important to note though, that there are many facilities where uh, you see that all of these things are met, but yet the performance is poor. Then you know that there's, there's something that is going on with the, with the way that the performance is being done that is causing that poor performance. But in this case, you can see that they actually did not meet the minimum requirements for them to conduct um, these services. Speaking about in, in indicators, um, you know, when you think about process indicators uh, that lead you to a place where you can screen clients for cervical cancer with fidelity, to me, what comes to my mind, and this requires time to bubble, but what comes to my mind is when you go to a facility as a woman living with HIV uh, within that target age group, how is, what processes do you go through that will make you end up in front of somebody who is a trained cervical cancer uh, uh, practitioner that can screen you? What processes yeah. do you go through? And, and those processes can be specific to a facility. So it can, it can and, and that is why understanding a patient flow, understanding of uh, creating a flow chart for how patients move in a facility is important in quality improvement. Sometimes you can, you, 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 it may be that flow that hinders people from getting to a place where, hinders women from getting to a place where they can be screened. So you can put some process indicators in there that will help you determine that actually patients are not getting to a place where they should be screened. And then you can use that to, to, fix, to fix the problem. I didn't quite see a, um, a number of process indicators in there, 
And I think that is something that you can look into uh, as a facility. Ask yourself, what are the processes that are involved in, in you know, in getting a, a woman living with HIV in that age group when they walk into a health facility to end up in front of somebody who has checked that they're eligible for this service and they and this person is then able to, to provide them the service. You will see that there, there'll be a lot of bottlenecks, barriers in there that you may fix to help improve um, to help improve the, the program. Lastly, um, it's the change package um, development. I really like I really like what you did, uh, where you put a table and you put an intervention. You put the month in which you you implemented the intervention, and you also you know put an effort to show us uh, the the change in the data after you had implemented that particular intervention. Those are the PDSA cycles that you saw in the slide that I shared um, earlier on. What works, you keep. What doesn't work, you drop. And as things are working, you are, you, are, you are adding them to your change package. And at some point, like Dr. Kozia was saying, and Dr. Omanza was saying, we must then put in an effort to bring these interventions to scale at provincial level so that we can test and see that they work in other places as well. Otherwise, a very uh, well done project. And uh, this is the culture that we want to institutionalize in our health facilities. Uh, Dr. Kozia, um, I think that's where I, I end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simpungwe. And uh, Susiku and the Western Province team, I know your project is still ongoing and uh, you're still doing some work on it. I uh, hope you've received some valuable comments, some inputs on your work, and then we can see how that, uh, 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 that program on cervical cancer in Western province really, really improves. And next, we'll be having best practices being shared by Western province when it comes to cervical cancer. Thank you very much for being courageous and sharing with us the, the, your project that you're doing in Western province. Thank you to our experts, uh, Dr. Wamwanza. Thank you to the didactic presenter, Dr. Simpungwe. Thank you very much to the team that I have with me in here. Uh, they kept me company. Uh, so it's a team from uh, Eastern Province uh, coming from the different districts. Uh, they've come uh, for just to, to understand how we provide advanced care and HIV. Then we, we want to thank the, the rest of the network uh, for joining us. We appreciate you and we hope that you've had a very uh, interesting session and uh, picked up quite a number of lessons uh, on the QI systems uh, in terms of uh, the HIV program. So this is where we come to an end for today. We will see you next week when we will be looking at another item on, um, on, uh, on a viral load. And so we will, we will be able to share with you the actual details of the of the of the of the of the of the presentation next week thank you so much and uh, have a pleasant day